It's been 50 years since the world's first successful human heart transplant made history. How far have we come since that medical milestone? And what beating heart technology will help shape the future? This is Inside Story. Hello there and welcome to the programme. I'm Laura Kyle. This week marks a significant milestone in experimental surgery, one that would be cheered and debated and forever talked about. Fifty years ago, South African surgeon Christian Bernard successfully performed the first human-to-human -human heart transplant. Since then, thousands of lives have been saved by this groundbreaking technology, mostly in developed nations. We'll get to our guests in just a moment, but first, Tanya Page looks back at this historic surgery. Grotteskeer Hospital is home to a museum dedicated to the world's first heart transplant. It happened in this room under the steady hand of Dr. Christian Barnard, who died in 2001. The surgery has barely changed in 50 years. What has, of course, dramatically changed is the post-operative immunosuppression, post-operative care, and that led to a phenomenal survival rate. We have today 70-80% of transplant patients living after 10 years. In 1967, the first transplant triggered a debate on whether it was ethical or not. Letters written at the time show a mixed response to the surgery. One doctor in the former Yugoslavia describes it as the most important event in the history of the human spirit. A man in Turkey wants to send everyone on the surgical team a new pair of shoes. Congratulations! But some were negative as well. One man in Australia has filed a complaint with the police. He thinks the operation was illegal. And this woman in Italy said, Never man shall be able to replace a human heart, as man can't replace God's will. Half a century later, a lack of education and awareness continues to prevent people from registering as organ donors. But without them, none of these men would be alive today. Three of them have new hearts, the fourth a transplanted kidney. We don't have a very strong tradition of people becoming organ donors. Why not consider living on through somebody else and giving somebody else a second chance and in that way, you know, leave a legacy? One legacy of Dr. Barnard's pioneering surgery is inspiration. The cardiology team at the hospital where he worked is continuing to break new ground, just launching a new plastic heart valve that could revolutionise the treatment of rheumatic heart disease. The significance of what we do now is a practical significance because we talk about 33 million patients who would otherwise die. These trainee nurses have come to be inspired by Dr. Barnard's work. They're looking at the first six hearts he transplanted. Some see the vital organ as the center of our emotions, others as a pump. But it's only understood as well as it is because of Dr. Barnard and his team. Tania Page, Al Jazeera, Cape Town. Well, heart transplants have become increasingly common since that first one back in 1967. Just one year later, more than 100 transplants were performed. And now there are nearly 4,000 around the world every year, most of them in the US. Even still, more people are waiting for hearts than ever before. In the UK, the number has more than doubled from 95 in 2008 to 249 this year. And the supply of organ donations has been nowhere near able to meet this growing demand. Well, let's bring in our guests now. And in Oxford, we have Dr. Stephen Westerby, Professor at Royal Brompton Hospital, Imperial College. In London, Dr. Olivia Gilbert, Assistant Professor at Wake Forest Baptist Medical Centre. And joining us via Skype from Cape Town, James Styan, author of the book Heartbreaker, Christian Barnard and the First Heart Transplant. Welcome to the programme, all of you. James, let's first start by taking a look back at that extraordinary procedure. Just how groundbreaking was it? It, it, it was great. It, I mean, it changed the world. Uh, it, it, for, for millennia, surgeons had been very fearful to, 
to work on the human heart. Uh, the heart was considered uh, the home of the soul. It was considered this mystical organ that was untouchable. Surgeons had been working for millennia, for centuries on every part of the body but the heart. And uh, the heart was further complicated by the fact that you couldn't work on it while, while it was beating. So it, it required a whole bunch of uh, groundbreaking technology, the open heart, the, the heart lung machine first to be developed to actually get people to be able to work on the organ. So uh, Christian Barnard actually managing to show that you can transplant a human heart into, into somebody's body who's dying, literally dying, and revive those patients uh, provided hope to people who had no hope before. Why did it happen in South Africa and not another country? For example, I believe the US was coming quite a close second. I think the it has to be the name Christian Barnard uh, to a large extent. The Americans were throwing billions at this program. It was uh, on par with the moon, with the race to land a man on the moon. Uh, South Africa, we it was a government owned a state hospital, public hospital, uh, but it had one difference. It had a guy who so believed in his way to, and he, he was so confident in in his ability and that that it would work. That he was willing to take the chance where many of the Americans perhaps weren't there yet. We have to remember that. Um, it, it took cutting out the heart of a desperately ill person, but mm. somebody who's still alive. So you, if, if it had not worked, imagine the repercussions on your professional career. Barnard would all, all likely have been charged with murder, might have lost his career, might have gone to jail if Washkansky, Louis Washkansky, the receiver of the first donor, uh, organ donor heart, hadn't woken up again. And that courage to be able to say, it's going to work, I'm going to do it, I think that was the major difference. Dr. Olivia, the operation has barely changed in the 50 years since it was first performed. I mean, that struck me in Tanya's report. How difficult is this procedure? Uh, well, there are there is a transition time um, and really a two-part procedure uh, in terms of the procurement of the organ, which has its own technicalities to be able to uh, preserve the heart in its most optimal form. The transportation of the heart, again, trying to focus on the preservation of the tissue and then the actual implantation. So rather than just a single uh, procedure, really two surgical operations and really this transport uh, process has also become an area of great focus in terms of the importance for preservation of the, the organ, limiting the amount of time in the transport as well as optimizing the condition. So, uh, really, I think it's it's very complex to sp to speak of all three aspects. Mm. Uh, Dr. Stephen, as James was saying, the uh, key to this first transplant success or acceptability was that the patient survived. But if we look at it, he only lasted 18 days due to complications. He got pneumonia, didn't he? Uh, what's the life expectancy now for someone who receives a transplant? What advances have we seen in these 50 years? Well, uh, there have been great advances. I mean, uh, to transplant a heart, the, the technicalities of that are not difficult at all. It's a very right. straightforward operation. The big issue was to keep that heart uh, safe within the chest afterwards because the, the recipient was always going to try and reject the organ. The, the immune response to the organ was the big problem. There had been years and years of work with dog heart transplants and baboon heart transplants in the United States before Barnard's first operation. What's more, there was a heart transplant in the United States intended to be a human heart transplant way back in 1964, three years before the Cape Town operation. On that occasion, the big issue was the definition of brain death. James Hardy in Mississippi had uh, a recipient lined up, a young man with a bad brain injury, but they just could not time the transfer of the heart from the donor into the patient. Um, so that patient ended up getting a chim chimpanzee's heart, mm. which rejected very, very rapidly, and the patient died on the operating table. What has happened in the past 50 years is that the immunosuppression has become much better. 
But how long do patients live? 60% uh, of the patients actually do not survive for 10 years. Uh, for those that do, uh, and you can spot the characteristics of the ones that are likely to do well, they may live for 20 uh, and in one case even 30 years. But for those that don't get a particularly good donor heart uh, and don't get to 10 years, the average survival is actually much more than four, not much more than four years. Mm. OK, uh, Dr Liver, do, do you expect those odds to improve more than 60% surviving 10 years? Oh, certainly. I, I think that there are a lot of uh, exciting um, technologies for us to uh, be able to understand different modalities of rejection and to understand how to deal with them. Even from a gene transcription uh, perspective, uh, there are thoughts to um, to modulate people's immune responses on a much closer and individualized basis that will be able to understand uh, their particular mechanisms for rejection and be able to respond appropriately. There's also been conjectures about uh, modulation of gut microbia and perhaps playing a role uh, in our ability to modulate the immune system. So there are certainly exciting technologies and thoughts on the horizon for perfecting this process. OK. James, does um, South Africa remain a pioneer in this field? I think uh, that uh, there's a, we, have, we have a number of challenges in our healthcare sector. Uh, so a lot of the mm. priorities, for example, was diverted towards HIV AIDS very successfully to combat that program over a number of years, given the scourge that, that AIDS was wreaking in South Africa. Uh, and and we, it's been a good, it's a very it's a, success, a successful story for the African government the attack on AIDS but that came at a, at some cost and I think and one of the costs was the impact that had on something like uh, transplant surgery and uh, in particular cardiac surgery uh, sadly uh, but but there is still some groundbreaking work in the area of cardiac surgery and one area at Kruderski Hospital and UCT University of Cape Town that they're currently developing and I think I believe they're in the final phases is a heart valve which can be um, which can be put into a human heart uh, without opening up the chest, so uh, minimally invasive, and mm. uh, it, that makes surgery a lot cheaper and a lot quicker. And we do believe, I, th I, I agree with the sentiment that the, the rheumatic fever is causing a lot of trouble in developing countries, especially in South Africa as well. Uh, and uh, and valves like that will be very important going forward to provide hope to thousands of desperately poor but desperately ill people. Stephen, what are your thoughts on valves like that, uh, especially as they do come with a much reduced price tag and they're therefore much more widely available? Well, I, I, we've been putting in uh, heart valves on the end of catheters for almost 10 years now. Uh, and indeed, my very good colleagues in, in South Africa have been doing that a long time. Um, I, I was a great admirer of many of the surgeons in South Africa, and I, I knew Chris Barnard very well. But at, at the end of the day, uh, you have to ask yourself, what, what was the legacy of that first heart transplant? In the UK, uh, there are around 15,000 patients under the age of 65 who die from severe heart failure each mm. year. For those patients, there are less than 150 donor hearts. So cardiac transplantation applies to less than 1% of the people that need it, even if we're very ageist. Heart failure is a disease of older people. Mm. And, and quite frankly, we have to do better. We will never generate more donor hearts, in my view. Uh, we've tried giving animal hearts uh, a, a go, but not got very far. But we do now have an alternative, and, and that is the miniature rotary blood pumps that are used quite extensively in the United States and are now coming up with uh, outcomes that rival heart transplantation. The, the first implant of one of these miniature artificial hearts that I did, uh, it was the first permanent one in the world, 
was in 2000, and the patient lived for almost eight years, and he had been deemed totally unsuitable for a heart transplant because of his kidney failure. I certainly want to look at the issues of donors or surrounding donors in, in just a moment. First of all, just to run with the, the introduction, that, Stephen, that you gave us there of the mechanical heart and alternatives to transplants. Olivia, do you believe that mechanical hearts can rival transplants? There are certainly uh, limitations to both heart transplantation and to mechanical circulatory support. Uh, at this point, uh, the survival outcomes are more favorable for transplantation, but to the point, the uh, resource is so limited and the need is so great that both technologies, I should say, both operations are needed to, to meet the needs of the growing heart failure population. So I, I think that the technology is greatly improving with mechanical circulatory support. At this moment, the survival outcomes are superior, uh, but I think that in conjunction with both technologies, and in fact, the transition from the use of mechanical circulatory support, even for short-term reasons, to be able to get a heart transplant, it's hard to speak of these uh, technologies without each other. They're very much needed to meet the need. So in answer to your question, at the moment, uh, no, I, I believe that heart transplant is superior if possible, but because of limited resources, we must focus to do all that we can to optimize mechanical circulatory support. Okay, why do we have limited resources? Why, as Stephen said, are we never going to generate enough donor hearts? Well, if we think about uh, the supply of hearts, uh, we have to be very particular about the selection process. Uh, it would do very little good for patients receiving hearts to receive uh, organs that were not optimally functioning. And so to be able to find hearts that come from recipients with, with hearts that are acceptable for donating can be a very challenging process. And as uh, has been alluded to, there have been previous attempts at even looking at other animal species. Uh, at this mm -hmm. point, there are also investigations into the use of deceased donors and high-risk donors, such as those with hepatitis C, as alternative donor sources. Uh, but it's really the idea of finding those hearts and those donors uh, that will provide an optimal organ for the recipients. James, what's the donor supply like in South Africa? Uh, terrible, <laughs> uh, for various reasons. Uh, I think it's the same across as across the world. And, but uh, but Chris Barnard also always said, you know, that that that's going to be a major problem. And later in his career, he said that that. Uh, but later in, in his career, he confirmed that was the case. But he he blamed bureaucracy to a large extent as well later. Um, and possibly one way of looking at it would have to would it would take some bold steps from politicians for example uh, i believe there's some countries in europe i think spain and and austria comes to mind where once you die, your body goes to the state. Perhaps mm -hmm. that's one way that one should look at organ donning, donation in future, where, where the state says that once you die, your body or your organs become the property of the state. To take away the, 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 almost the, the, the problem with families who might be very lax to say, well, you can have my partner or my children's organs. I mean, it's a very difficult thing for you to do, but if it's mandated perhaps by state or by law, it might be very, much easier in, in later, later in life you look back and you say, yeah, well, it was the right decision. Stephen, the, the UK is taking one of those bold steps, isn't it? I mean, they're moving towards assuming that everyone is an organ donor unless they expressly object otherwise. How's that going down in the UK? Well, it's not. Um, it started in Wales and mm. uh, the response has been minimal. Um, 
It has been tried in other countries, in, in uh, France and Brazil. Spain have the largest uh, organ donation rates, and they certainly do not uh, go for this uh, presumed consent approach. Um, it, it's, it's more about talking to the relatives of mm. potential donors much earlier and giving them an understanding of, of the benefits of transplantation. But whatever you do, you are simply not going to increase the pool of donors. It's been talked about for 30, 40, and now almost 50 years, and it simply is not making a, a significant difference. Now, what we have to do is, is find other me methods of making that difference. Uh, and one way of going about this is, is with the use of stem cells mm -hmm. uh, in conjunction with the rotary blood pumps. And uh, we've gone that way, uh, certainly not in patients in the National Health Service here, but I've been doing that with colleagues in Greece. Um, and we have now a stem cell that will remove scar from adult heart muscle after the patient has had a heart attack. So if you now have patients that are, are dying from end-stage coronary artery disease and, and what we call ischemic cardiomyopathy, they would probably be just as well having a pump to save their lives and stem cells injected at the same time to regenerate their own heart muscle. Um, and I, I think that's going to be the way to go for the future. I mean, it's very important to carry on with heart transplantation, particularly for children with severely deformed hearts, uh, congenital heart disease. But for the vast majority of patients with coronary artery disease that have heart attacks, we need to find a different solution. Uh, and we're well on the way to doing that. OK. Olivia, are you on board with this finding of a different solution? Absolutely. Absolutely. I just would emphasize uh, that I think transplantation will continue to uh, play a role, um, but to the point that alternative sources of mechanical circulatory support are absolutely needed to meet the need. James, there was a lot of uh, ethical controversy, wasn't there, when the first uh, transplant happened all those years ago. People believed that they were taking someone's soul out and replacing it with something else. I mean, now look what we're talking about. We're talking about putting in cells. We're talking about putting in uh, foreign material entirely, a mechanical heart. Do you think there's still a large ethical debate to be had around this procedure? I think ethics uh, is great. But if you somebody dying uh, at end stage heart disease, um, you, you've got a you've got a different uh, view uh, of things. Uh, I, th I think there's always going to be ethical debates. Uh, you know, the pro versus pro life versus abortion debate. I mean, it's never going to go away. Mm. Um, and so, so ethics is certainly important. But at the end of the day, you've got to look at trying trying to treat patients that are dying. And uh, the World Health Organization two years ago, I think, said that 17 million people around the world died of of heart disease, I think it was the biggest killer globally, uh, cardiac disease. So we've got to do something, and we've got to do something about poor people in developing countries, in sub-Saharan Africa. People are dying in the hundreds of thousands and increasing uh, annually because of lifestyle change, uh, urbanization, bad diet, uh, bad you know, the bad lifestyle um, habits. So it's it's increasing, and these are areas where 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 we need desperately some interventions that are not costly. And where we need to to look at at making a, a real change, which is what Barnard was, I think, trying to do back in 1967, trying to say, you know, yeah, we've got to do something for somebody who has no other no other option. Uh, and ethics, while they are important, and I think they were important to him to some extent, I think for him it was finding about finding a clinical treatment to help the dying patient, and I think that should be the focus. Well, there's an extraordinary technology back then, and it remains so today. Thank you very much to all our guests for joining us here today on Inside Story. Dr. Stephen Westerby, Dr. Olivia Gilbert, and James Styan.
And thank you too for watching. You can see the programme again anytime by visiting our website, aljazeera.com. And for further discussion, do go to our Facebook page. That's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. And you can join the conversation on Twitter. Our handle is at AJ Inside Story. From me, Laura Kyle and the whole team here, bye for now.